we turn this evening to the book of Job and in chapter 22 part of the um, conversation the back and forth that goes between Job and his friends that have gathered to comfort him and counsel him in all his time of trouble they didn't always say the wisest thing by any means Uh, Not the appropriate thing as far as he was concerned, but nevertheless, in all of this, there is very wise counsel and very important lessons to learn. For example, in chapter 22 and verse 21, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Well, that's the, the main text, as it were, and I want to look at that text in the context of the verses that follow. Um, Acquaint now thyself with him. Well, how do we do that? And why should we do that? And then the verse goes on to say, thereby good shall come unto thee. Well, what good does that mean? Well, the verses that follow give illustrations of the good that come to those who are acquainted with God through his own word and through Christ. Well, let's begin then with the opening part. Acquaint thyself with him. What God is actually and truly like, that's the first thing that we need to discover. People born into the world, they have their own thoughts and ideas and imaginations of what God is and what God is like. And usually they're wide of the mark and short of the standard. They really do not know what God really is and what God is like. And uh, people, of course, live at a distance from him. Uh, Someone that you don't really know, you tend to be suspicious of. And I think that's what happens in the world. They don't really know. They don't know what to expect of him. They don't know what he thinks. They don't know what kind of character he's got. And uh, they keep at a distance from him. The great fear, of course, with most people is that if God comes into their lives, he will be intrusive and overbearing and demanding and want them to do this and that, which naturally they don't want to do. And so they keep away from him. They're suspicious of his motives and of his, of his ways. And uh, so for these reasons, people generally in the world have got no idea what God is like. They have got no idea what it is to live under his rule or with trust in him it's a foreign language to them and it's a great tragedy isn't it that there are so many millions of people just in our own land who are in that condition well the word here says acquaint thyself with him it begins doesn't it by coming to know what God is truly and actually like but more than that coming to know him in a familiar sense When I go about to different meetings from time to time, people often say to me, do you know so-and-so? Well, sometimes I know the name. Um, Sometimes I've never heard of them. That may not be a great surprise. They've probably never heard of me either. But there we are. That's how it is, isn't it? Um, You you, you may know of somebody, but it's not the same as knowing somebody. And there are many famous people in the world and we know about them, but we don't know them. We don't know what they're like in their personal lives. They don't know what their real character's like. We certainly don't, want know, don't know what it's like to live in their homes. We're not familiar with them. We're not on those familiar terms with them. And the great call here in this verse is not just to know what God is like, but to get to know him to be on terms with him so that you know what it's like to call upon him. You know what it's like to hear his word. You know what it's like to receive his blessings. You know what it's like to be a servant of God. You don't come to the Lord and almost have to to go through the process of introduction, as it were. Um, I say that because that's that's how it... uh, it is when you meet somebody for the first time, isn't it? Or, or you haven't met somebody for a long time. I had contact just last year from somebody that I knew at school. I haven't seen him for decades. 
and if we were to get together it would be a whole process of getting to know each other all over again because it's been such a very long time. I know of him, I know him how he was 40 years ago or whatever it might have been, but I don't know what he's like now and he doesn't know me. And there would be this introduction process. Well, we want to know the Lord in the sense that we, we know what he's like now and he knows us and we're open together and, and we can have these familiar terms, not suspicion and fear and avoidance, but this close walk and close knowledge of our God. Well, the friend of Job goes on to say that this is the way to be at peace. I would think it's very true that much of the disturbance in people's lives is caused because they don't know God, because they're struggling in a difficult world and through difficult lives, facing an uncertain future and certainly an unknown eternity. And how can you have peace when you're in that state? How can you? But when you know the Lord, when you're familiar with God and his ways, and particularly his way of salvation, then everything takes on a whole different tone. You know the God who commands and controls the entire universe. You know and can trust the God that has your life in his hands. You know and you can trust your soul to that God. And you know that everything in the end is going to be good, it will be well with your soul because you know the God who is your saviour. So peace comes when we know the Lord. Well, how do we come to know the Lord? And then we'll think afterwards about the blessings that come, the good that comes, as uh, verse 22 goes on to say. Well, how can we come to know this God? Well, in verse um, verse 22, I think I've been referring to 22 as though it's, <clears throat> but rather it should have been verse 21. Verse 22 says, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. That's how we know the Lord, through his own word. Left to our imaginations, God can turn into anything. He can become a tyrant, an ogre, or he can become one who is so beneficent and gentle with people that he never rebukes them for their sin, he has, never has a cross word for them. But that's not the Lord. Neither of those things are the Lord. They're a caricature of God that are far from tr the truth. And the only way that we can discover the truth about the Lord is by receiving the law from his mouth and laying up his words in our hearts. Receive. That means to accept it and even to welcome it as it is. And again, you see, part of our great problem is that we may well know what God's word says about him and we don't receive it. We quarrel with it. There are people about like that, you know, and you come across them sometimes and they, you tell them what God's word says about God and they say, well, that's not the God that I want to be there. And we might say, well, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> That's the God that is there. You can't change him. And we must receive his word and his declaration of his own being. He's not going to change because we don't like him being like that. Because the world wriggles and squirms under his authority doesn't mean to say that he's going to leave his throne and, and abandon his rule over all things. He will always be the God that he is and nothing will ever change him. <coughs> So we must receive his word, accept it. And then, of course, the, the other aspect that's closely um, connected with that is the, the requirements that God puts upon us, the demands that he makes of us, the lives that he expects us to lead, the reliance that we're supposed to place upon him, all of these things. You see, it sets God up as being the ruler, the sovereign, the one before whom we must bow and be servants to him. We must acknowledge that he has the right over us and the rights that he exerts are good and perfect and kind and for our good. And to receive his word means to acknowledge that he is a God like that and it is for his glory but it's for our good that we receive what he says. 
that we don't turn away from him because he says this or that or the other, but we receive every aspect of his truth, every aspect of his commandments as being right and good and for our benefit. Now to be acquainted with God, of course, means a great deal more than simply knowing what he's like and knowing what he requires of us and his authority over us. A very central part of all of this is the gospel, the way of salvation. You can never really be acquainted with God unless you come to him through Christ. You can never really know what he is and what he's like in terms of his mercy and grace and transforming power until we come to him through Christ, until we give up all hope of making ourselves right or acceptable, until we give up all hope of ever making an atonement for our own sins. It's when we come to him in his own way and upon his own terms by relying upon Christ that we really come to be near the Lord and to know him. Know all his fatherly care and his tender ways that all comes as we submit ourselves to his son and, be, and receive him as our saviour. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. Receive means believe. Be humble before it. Do you receive God's word for, for what it is? You know that there's uh, great theological terms that define God's word and, and show it, and, and the Bible is its own interpreter, and it makes claims about itself, and it says that it is pure, which means it's not mixed up with error. It's all right, it's all true. And it's the lens through which we look at every other claim that people make in the world. Pure, true from the beginning, inspired by God. This is not just a collection of men's writings. It's a collection of the Holy Spirit's writings given over many centuries and through many different writers. Now I can tell you all of that and you can go away and think, well that was very interesting. But that's not the same as receiving what it says, is it? It's not the same as receiving its truth and receiving it to yourself. God's law, God's word, God's promises, God's warnings, God's gospel. Receive it, believe it, welcome it. Hang your soul upon the truth of it. Depend upon it for all of your life and for all of eternity. That's what receiving the word means. And that's how we be become to acquaint ourselves with the Lord. It goes on to say, lay up his words in thine heart. Well, I've spoken about this before some time ago now, but the old lost art of meditation. Meditation. You know, you see the, the cattle and the sheep in the fields and they've been munching on the, the grass all morning and they, um, if, if I'm not right here, I've got some wrong zoological or biological description here. You can come and tell me afterwards. This is the impression I get, though. They've been, they've been chewing on the grass, feeding themselves all, all morning, and then they, they go off in a corner and they lay down, and they're still chewing, aren't they? They're still chewing. They're extracting all of the benefit that they can find out of that grass. That's what we need to learn to do with God's Word, to extract all the juice all the benefit, all the blessings, all the spiritual vitamins and proteins that there are there to feed our souls and to build ourselves up. It's a lost art. How easy it is to, to read the scriptures for yourself at home or to come into a service like this and, and to listen and to, 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 to understand the words that you read, whatever it might be. And then we're all off back in the world in five minutes' time and we can hardly remember what we've heard or what we've read. That's how it is, isn't it? Meditation, thinking, chewing over in the mind the things of God's word. That's how we really acquaint ourselves with the Lord. I don't think we'd ever get to know each other very much or very well if we had a conversation 
with, uh, with each other and then five minutes later we'd forgotten what they said we'd forgotten all they told us about themselves and it was all gone it was all gone I, I remember the face but, but who are you we might say well that's not acquaintanceship is it that's not a close knowledge and an intimacy with, with people on a social level, on a friendship level. And we must learn to remember the things that the Lord says to us, to get into these good habits of learning and reading and thinking about the Word of God. Acquaint thyself with Him. And Him. With Him. You see, that's what the Bible leads us to. That's what the great study called theology is all about not just amassing facts and figures about the Word of God and various doctrines. If they don't lead us to God, they'll lead us nowhere. We might be wonderful theologians, we may have a, a great mass of information with which we can impress our friends and the world and anybody who has time to listen to us. But if they haven't led us to God, then we're no better, are we? Read the word, listen to the word, and see how it would lead you to God, that you may be acquainted with him, that you may know him for yourself. Well, we need to know him then, and we need to know him through Christ, to know him as our God, as our maker, as our saviour, as our redeemer, as the one who will see us through life and take us into heaven without sin, without spot, without blemish. The way to find peace and the way to find the good that God promises to give to those who trust him. So from verse 23 to the end of the chapter, we'll see how far we can get with this. We have these verses that illustrate to us the blessings or the good that God gives to those who become acquainted with him who receive his word, who believe his gospel, who know him through Christ. To begin with, in verse 23, it says, If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Well, that little expression there, built up, includes the idea of repair. Repair from damage. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be repaired. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. And that expression, if thou wilt return unto him, has been translated by some of the old writers as, if you will come home to him. Now what does that put you in mind of immediately but the prodigal son? That, that young man that had... Um, taken his portion of his inheritance and gone off into a far country and wasted the whole lot on riotous living and got himself into a terrible mess and then he came home. He came home contrite, repentant and he was received home by his father who had not ceased to love him. So, verse 23 again, If thou return, if thou wilt come home to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, thou shalt be repaired, thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Well, repair, as I say, implies damage. And uh, we're damaged. We can become damaged by all kinds of things in a life without God, when we don't know him, when we're not acquainted with him. Most people in this world become damaged in some sort of way because of things that happen to them, unhappy experiences. And very often these things happen at a time in people's lives when they didn't know anything about the fact that they can turn to God. They didn't know that they can come to this Lord and find forgiveness for their sins and find help and grace in, in, in their time of trouble and, and it brings people down doesn't it inevitably 
It causes us emotional distress and, and all kinds of problems. Um, and here's the promise that, that the Lord will, will repair us. He'll build us up again. He will give us an, a new strength and a, and a new um, way of dealing with things. He may not remove the whole of the problem, but he'll give us the grace and the help to, to sus- be sustained through those things. And, and lives that maybe were limping along because of all the effects of, of these events and experiences, well, we're given a strength that we don't limp along rather anymore, but rather we, we, we're given grace to, to go on and to learn and to go forward. Certainly, we're damaged because of our own sin. And people don't see that, do they? All of the ways in which we affect ourselves because of our sin. I often think of that man who was in the Gadarenes. You remember the man that lived in the, among the graves? And uh, in such a, a terrible state, demon-possessed. And he would live there in that awful, gloomy sort of surrounding and he would we're told cut himself with stones and so forth and there is that man in that terrible state bearing all the scars of that self-inflicted wounds that were, that were coming upon him and, and that's what sin does to us that's what the influence of sin and Satan does to us and we, we take hold of these things and we wound ourselves we we affect our consciences our consciences are weakened and and they don't respond as they ought to we become so used to sin that we don't recognize it as being that anymore and that's not how we're meant to be we're damaged we're almost in a state of ruin if our consciences are not working properly the temptations will come fast enough And they'll come in a timely sort of way. The Satan will make sure of that. And if our consciences are so dead to to the temptation that we don't recognize it for what it is, and we embrace it as being a friend instead of warded off for the enemy that it is, of course we become damaged. Of course it has a bad effect upon us. So there's one way in which we become damaged. But you see, when we turn to the Lord, we come home. When we turn to him that conscience is quickened. We're feeding it by God's word. We're enlightening our minds and we're we're being instructed as to what is right and what is wrong. And now, when temptation rears its head and appears on the horizon, we see it for what it is. This is not my friend. This is not coming to enhance and enrich my life. This is coming to damage me. And I know that if I... Um, if I yield to this temptation then, then I will live to regret it I will live to regret it my, my life will be affected perhaps others around me will be affected and this is because we've come home and God is speaking and feeding us in our minds and in our hearts as to what is right and what is wrong not only a negative thing not only that we resist and want to drive iniquity far from our tabernacles, from our homes and our lives, we rather have a desire for what's good. That's the positive side, isn't it? That's what we want. That's what the Lord instills within us. So instead of bringing ourselves down all the time, he's building, building us up and repairing us and making us what we ought to be in that respect. And of course, if conscience is damaged, so is character. Our characters are altered. We become, um, well, it could be anything. We could become people who are prone to uh, deceive or people who become prone to lose our tempers or people who become prone to um, get involved in unsavory activities because of the, 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 the influence of sin upon us. And of course, our character is affected by that. But when we come home and the Lord begins to, to change us from, from one character into another, everything's on the mend, you see. We're being repaired and built up. And our character is being restored to what it should be. People who love that which is good. People who 
measure their lives by God's own standards. We also damage ourselves, I'll mention this as well because it's true, we damage ourselves because we make so many blunders and so many mistakes when we don't rely upon the Lord to guide us. We go and do this and we go and do that because we thought it seemed like a good idea at a time. But we never consulted the Lord. We didn't think of that. It's just what we wanted to do. Someone said to me the other day that um, somebody in their church, on his church, I should say, pastor, was telling me that somebody in his church um, came to him one day and said that they wanted to, to follow this course of action and um, did he you know, think that this would be a good thing for them to do and uh, it clearly wasn't and he told them so and then he discovered that they'd already gone and done it anyway and uh, really what they wanted was for him just to put his rubber stamp and seal upon it and to give them a better feeling about the whole thing but it was obviously the wrong thing to do but now this particular individual is in a terrible state because they didn't consult the Lord and damage has been done. Oh, how easy that is to happen. We get these fixations in our mind and we're determined that we're going to do that and we just hope that the Lord will follow us and bless us anyway without really asking him, is this right? And really coming to him wanting to know whether this is his will or whether this is just going to turn out to be a disaster and we're damaged. But when we come home, the Lord has a way of building us up and repairing us. We may have to live with the effects of it all, or but how the Lord graciously gives us strength. And of course, he does have a way of overruling all of these things. But never to encourage us when we're walking in wrong paths, when we come home and when we settle down at home, then it is that he begins to build us up and to help us along the way. So that's one aspect of good. Wonderful thing to come home. It's a sense of belonging, isn't it? Sense of belonging. I'm sure that when that prodigal son got over the fact that his father still loved him and that he didn't want him to be a servant but rather he wanted to be his son to be a son and bring out the fatted calf and bring out the ring and the best robe and all the rest of it when he got over that and when his brother hopefully so far as we can we can hope got over the fact as well I'm sure that his heart must have been filled with joy that he come home. And that ruined life was being repaired. Oh, friends, is that what we need to come home and to settle down with the Lord, acquainted with him and determined to not repeat the mistakes of the past but want to go on with the Lord and to be built up in our faith and in our love for him and in our lives before him. What a wonderful prospect. What a wonderful beginning when we come to faith in the Saviour. And then verse 24. We're clearly not going to get all the way through this chapter, but we'll mention perhaps two more verses. Look at verse 24. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Well, gold as dust makes us to think about um, the dust of the, of the desert or the dust on the seashore, this immense amount of gold dust, particularly pertinent in our day, isn't it, when the price of gold has gone up so much. But there we are, this vast amount of gold dust and the gold of Ophir, um, said to be the highest quality of gold that was available from Arabia. Thou shalt lay up gold as dust and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks, the finest of gold. 
Well, I expect there'll be a lot of preachers around in the world today that will tell you that if you come and give to God, then God will make you rich. That's what a lot of people will teach you. Um, that's what a lot of preachers will say. The more you give to me, the more God will give to you. And so you've got a lot of preachers, particularly in America, in Central America, who have their um, vast mansions and their private jets and their yachts awaiting in the in the Caribbean because they've persuaded gullible people to give as much money as they can to the preacher in return for which God will make them rich. Well, as you might expect, I'm not going to stand here tonight and tell you that. Probably, for most of us, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen to us. God made Solomon rich, but before God made Solomon rich, he made him wise. It's a great sadness that Solomon fell away, but notice the order of that, wisdom and riches. What this does mean is that God enriches those who are acquainted with him, who know him through Christ. He enriches us in a wonderful spiritual way. And that's what really matters. That's what really counts. We can have all the riches in the world, but if we're not at peace in our heart, what good does it do us? We can't be happy, can we? You hear about these people that, that religiously buy their lottery tickets every week and you hear on the news every now and again that someone has won this colossal fortune on some European lottery, whatever it is, hundreds of millions of pounds. And you just think to yourself, what a terrible burden to bear. And they think it's going to make them happy. But if they're not happy within their... If they have got not peace, it doesn't matter how much riches they have, it doesn't matter where they go or what they do, they will never really be happy. Whereas God has the most wonderful way of turning poverty into riches. He has this most wonderful way of coming alongside us and feeding us with his blessings and, and the ministry of his Holy Spirit and reminding us of Christ and of reminding us that he's the God who controls all things, that he can, he'll, he can and he will give us all that is needful for us, all that is right, all that is good, all that will most tend to our spiritual well-being, our real inward peace, our real spiritual prosperity. That's what the Lord gives us. And he reminds us as well that beyond everything that we may have from his hand in this life awaits heaven, eternity. All the glory that's there, all the beauty, the holiness, the righteousness, the happiness that awaits us. That's what the gold of Ophir means. Those are the blessings that God bestows. Or to think that we just come to God because we have a little problem and we want him to solve it. Or because we're a bit poor and we think he'll make us rich in this world. What kind of good news is that? Or the Lord deals in greater mercies than that. He enriches our hearts and our souls. He gives us himself. He shows us all these thrilling doctrines of the scripture. He gives us a life to live he gives us a future to look forward to. He gives us purpose and hope. He gives us everything. The gold of Ophir indeed. And then verse 25. The, yea, the Almighty shall be thy defence and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Defence or in the Hebrew defences. All kinds of defences. Defences, we might say, against sin and temptation and Satan and against all the trickery and the deception of the world. Defences against the t those times when trouble and grief come upon us and they would overwhelm us, but the Lord defends us against such things and gives us hope and comfort and grace in these things. The Almighty shall be thy defence. The infinite God or well, this is what it means to be acquainted with the Lord. It means to say that he is 
before us and around us and above us and beneath us and behind us, ever watching, ever guarding, ever protecting, ever leading, ever ensuring that we're in the centre of his blessed will. What a privilege and a wonderful thing to know. And thou shalt have plenty of silver. Now that's not a promise for riches either in this verse, not in that sense. But you see, what that implies is that that when people generally in the world have their problems and their troubles, they look around to see what worldly means of help they can find, what defences they can erect against the onslaught of trouble and, and uh, need and all the rest of it. Where can I turn? Who can help me? What can I do? You know, the, the, the river banks overflow and the floods come and you look to, to put the sandbanks out. Well, use that illustration in, in all kinds of difficulties in life and what can I do to, to keep my peace and what can I do to protect my property and my health and all the rest of it because all of it gets assailed in one way or another and they rely on silver and the efforts of the world well we must use these things that we have in a practical way but we have more than that we have more than that. The Almighty shall be thy defence. Well, as years go by and the end of life gets nearer, there is that tremendous prospect in store, isn't there, of leaving this world and going into the next. That's what we have to face up to, isn't it? And how people turn to silver and this and that and the other to defend themselves against their fears and their worries and their anxieties. All the uncertainty of what lies beyond. They look back, they look back, they don't want to leave, they don't want to give it all up. They cling on to this, they cling on to that. They entertain one hope after the other. And all these are defences to try and keep out the fear and to subdue their anxiety. But one who is acquainted with the Lord has much better things than that. We have the knowledge of Christ. We have the certainty of our standing before God in the Lord Jesus. We know, those that are acquainted with the Lord, we know that our sins that would keep us out of heaven are all forgiven. That the God who has the right to welcome us in or to keep us out of heaven has himself justified us pronounced as righteous in Jesus Christ. And we've got nothing to fear. That's our defence at that time. And what a defence it is. Satan can taunt us and he can bring back to our memories all the ways in which we failed the Lord and sinned against him, all of those dreadful things that we've done in our lives. But the defence we have against him and all our fears is Jesus Christ and the gospel and the promises of God. Well, what would you rather have? The silver of the world or Christ? All the vain, empty promises and, and solaces that the world has to offer or the things that God himself says? You see, these verses are full of wonderful promises. The good that comes to those who are acquainted with the Lord. The ones who stand before God and seek his blessing. Well, the time has gone and uh, there were three more things I was going to say but we'll have to leave them go and uh, content ourselves with that. But I suggest to you that that's enough to whet your appetite, isn't it? That's enough to want you, to make you want to be acquainted with this God. Where else can you find these things? Who else in this whole universe can ever bring you good like the Lord can? He's a God to know a God to trust, a God to live with forever. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, how wonderful it is that we who are so very small and so very sinful, so estranged from thee by our sins, can be acquainted with thee, can come and know thee as our God and as our Saviour. 
can speak to thee on such familiar terms and can hear thy voice speaking to us so clearly about thy grace and love and mercy and forgiving love through the Lord Jesus Christ. And how wonderful to know that when we know thee we can expect to receive all these good things that we've thought about this evening and much, much more beside. Lord, thou art a gracious God indeed and we pray that we will know thee as we ought to, as we can do and that no longer will we live at a distance from thee or be suspicious of thee but rather trust thee as a God of mercy and love and goodness. Lord, show thyself to us, draw near to us and draw faith from our hearts for our Saviour's sake. Amen.